Michael Curling is a professor of computer science at Kent University. That's on the other side of the pond. He's come tonight to, he's a, been very invested in building tools and um, helping develop computer science education. We're super excited because this is what our students are doing right now. They're in this interface. And we're going to learn a lot more about that tonight. So please give it up for Professor Curling. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I haven't prepared very much about what I'm going to say. I have worked for quite a long time on various tools for teaching and learning programming. Um, I work at the University of Kent in England. I work in a, a computer science research group there. And my field is the building of software tools for teaching and learning programming, and I've done that for a while. I had planned today to talk mostly about Greenfoot, but I will talk for only a fairly short amount of time. I had planned I might just give a general introduction for 20 minutes or so, and then mostly um, do this as a question answer session and, and um, take questions or suggestions what you would actually like to know and what you would li like me to talk about. Um, one other thing I should mention is with a projector here, this is cutting off about a third of my screen at the top. So uh, if I, if I don't remember this and I move my windows up there and they go out of view, you just have to shout at me so that I do my demos actually where you can see them. Um, I think I will spend quite a bit of time just doing demos and showing you things. I have no slides prepared. Um, to start, I thought I'll give you a quick overview of a Greenfoot. I've heard that some of you know already what it is. Can you just tell me, raise your hand, if you have seen Greenfoot before? OK, that's about half. All right. Um, then you'll have to sit through what you may know already when I introduce what it is. But I will start then with just showing you what Greenfoot is. And um, we are also, at the moment, working on a quite significant, significantly different new version of Greenfoot that um, will come out sometime in the near future. At some stage this evening, I will also show you what we are working on and what the next version will look like. Uh, but what I'm going to start with is the current version of Greenfoot. That is the one that is actually released now, that is out, that you can get where the material exists and so on. Um, so for you, those who don't know, Greenfoot is a, an integrated development environment for teaching and learning object-oriented programming. It is a very specialized environment. Technically, it's a meta framework for micro worlds. That means, you know, it's, well, I don't have to, you'll see it. I don't have to give you definitions here, textbook definitions. Um, it is an environment where kids can program and build games or simulations, graphical interactive applications. It is specialized to, to build um, graphical um, animated applications easily and quickly. For me personally, this was, maybe I should give you a bit of my personal background. Um, I came into this teaching at school level from the higher end. I, my day job is at university, I teach at university, and my whole thinking about teaching programming initially started by thinking about university teaching. For Greenfoot, the target age group is about 14-year-olds upwards. Uh, it can be used throughout middle school, high school, to the end. Um, it is also quite regularly used at college or university level for short amounts of time. But sort of the main target group is maybe sort of 14 to 18 year olds. Um, when before Greenfoot, we had another environment that was called Blue Jay. Well, is called. It also is still around. It's still it's still alive and going strong. When we designed Blue Jay, Blue Jay is a lot older. Um, when we designed Blue Jay, I had in mind introductory programming, what I thought is the beginning of programming. And at the time, that was sort of in the late 90s, in my mind, beginning of programming was the first semester at university. Um, and so Blue Jay was designed really with introductory university students in mind. That is also not quite true anymore, strictly speaking, as a target group. Blue Jay is also used at school level quite extensively, in fact, and actually seems to work for some people in school as well. But I had no experience at school when I designed it. My, my target group that I had in mind was really um, university students. But I was always interested in getting them early, you know, get, getting the, you know, 
learners of programming when they start out, you know, so that they can, that I get them right at the beginning when they still believe what you say and they do what you, um, and I realized more and more as time went on that all the interesting stuff doesn't happen at university. All the interesting stuff actually happens before they come to us. It all happens at school. At school age, they actually decide whether they are interested in computer science at all or not. And if they're not, then they're not, then they're not coming to us. I don't even see them. There. No intervention, you know, no fantastic teaching or so that I do makes any difference because I don't even see them. They don't even come to me. You know, the decision is made before. And so the school space is actually the much more exciting space. That's where all the important stuff happens, that's where they get their first exposure and their experience, and that's where they make the decision about whether they want to learn any more about this or not. So with Greenfoot, the, that was for me a shift in target group. I started thinking about school age pupils as a target group rather than university students. And that has quite significant differences in the design of the environment. Because the major difference that I that I, as I see it in teaching between university teaching and school teaching is that at university level, if you teach like I do at a university, you have a select audience. You know, they have all already made a decision that they want to be there. And because of that, your life is much, much easier. Now, at a school, you have a much harder problem. At the university, they, and especially if you, if you as I do, um, teach in the UK or in Europe because we don't have, we don't declare masters um, or, or a major, sorry, we don't declare a major later during the study. If you enroll at university, you enroll for computer science from your first day on. Uh, so those students who come to me in my first year, they have decided they want to do computer science. So they have by definition some interest in the subject, even sometimes it's only their parents pushing, but anyway, they have some interest in the subject, and because of that, you know, I have much more time. You know, they are actually listening to what I say. They, they want to be there. They are paying a lot of money. They invest their time. If you go into a typical high school in the UK, and I imagine it's not that much difference here, um, and you go into a class of 15-year-olds and you say, today we are going to learn programming, before you even start, two-thirds are already not interested. And that's the major difference, and that's the problem you have to overcome. I always thought when we designed BlueJay, I always thought the first thing you have to do, what you have to achieve, is to teach them the important principles correctly and properly, you know, in a way that, that they can understand them and as that, that is true to you know, what it really is. And, and you know, teach the, this teaching of the important principles early was always sort of my, my big goal. At school level, that's completely wrong. That is not the first thing you need to do. The first thing you need to do is to get them interested. Now, and then once they're interested, then you can teach them anything you like. But the first thing, the first problem you have to solve to be able to be successful in any way is to generate motivation. And that is why it has to be fun. And I like, I, I'm, not, I'm a bit suspicious of that word, you know, fun. But there's, having fun and learning is not a contradiction. You know, it's allowed to have fun. It has to be engaging very quickly from the beginning because you have this resistance of people who through some prejudice or other already think it's not for them and they don't want to know. Um, and you have to show them that actually they do want to know. Um, and so with Greenfoot, the aim was to get something happening on screen very quickly to get animated graphical things going within the first 15 minutes of, of looking at it. You know, certainly before they leave you for the first time after the first class lesson. And so here on the screen, this is Greenfoot. Um, and Greenfoot is a system that is based on Java. So programming in Greenfoot is standard Java. So it is, that is where the lower age range comes from also. You know, because of the Java syntax, 14-year-old for general classes or so is, is about as low as you can go. If you have really bright, interested individuals, you can sometimes go lower. You know, if you have a really bright kids, 12-year-olds can sometimes do it. But as an average class, I think there is about the, the boundary. I have here a diagram on the right-hand side. These are classes. I will not teach you Java tonight. So if you don't know Java, if you don't know object-oriented programming, um, don't worry about it. You will get the idea without it, I, I, but I will use some of the terminology of Java. Um, if that's not familiar to you, don't worry, it's not that important. There is no test at the end here. Um, so here are my classes. In Java, you program by defining classes. This diagram here shows the classes that are involved in this project. 
in Greenfoot, we call them scenarios. So this is a scenario that is already prepared. That's another thing that we do in teaching. But we don't start with a blank screen. We start by giving them um, an example, a project that already does something. And then first we let them play with it. And the next step, we let them make modifications and then extensions. And much, much later, they get to the point where they create something entirely new from scratch. But that is quite an advanced exercise. You know, this old style teaching that certainly I learned and many of you maybe as well, where on the first day, you know, you open a blank text editor and it's all white, you know, and now we start typing. It's, that's a disaster, you know, that's a very advanced exercise. Um, if you actually have to decide what is your writing, you have to decide what classes you need, what methods you need, that's a design exercise. It's at a higher order uh, cognitive function. That is a much harder thing that you shouldn't be doing at the beginning. So here I have my classes. Um, these two, world and actor, at, uh, at the receiving end of these arrows here. They are super classes of these. Others. These are built into the environment. They are built into Greenfoot. And the ones underneath, Bombad World and these two here, are part of this particular scenario. So they will be different with different projects. Um, the big area here that you see on screen is what we call the world. This, this sandy area, that's an instance, so now an object of that Wombelt world class. So the world itself is also an object of this class. And then you have classes here. From these classes, you can now interactively create an object. So I can right click on this, I can say new Wombat, and I put my object into the world, and there it is. If I have an object in the world, I can right click on it, and I can see all the methods, the public methods that this Java object has. And again, if you're not familiar, method is, a, is what Java calls the actions that an object can perform. But you can, I can now select any of them, and I can click on them. And by clicking on them, I can invoke this method. So if I select move, that one bed moves a step forward. I can do that again, but you can see that. I can say move, and it moves. Or I say turn left, and it turns left. Very important to show is also I can create more than one Wombat. From my Wombat class, I can create as many Wombats as I like. And I can also tell this one to move, and then that one will move. So I can talk to any of my objects by invoking the methods. The methods are determined by the object itself. So this object offers me a set of methods. So it has a defined you know, set of actions that it can perform, and I can talk to it by choosing any of those. These methods can have parameters. For example, here is one, it's called set direction. If I invoke this, and we can see here there's a signature, this has an int direction, this has an int parameter. If I invoke a method that has a parameter, a dialog will pop up and it asks me to enter a value for the parameter. It shows me the comment for the method, it shows me the signature, and then it shows me actually in Java syntax the call that is represented by this interaction. Um, I can type in a value and click OK, and this will be performed. The same is, is also possible with return values. If a method has a return value, for example, here is what have we got? Can move is a method that returns a boolean that tells me whether this wombat can currently move forward. If I so invoking this method is like asking a question. If I invoke can move, I'm essentially asking this wombat, can you move forward at the moment? If I invoke this, the result pops up and it says true. Yes it can move. Um, if I place it over here, because in Greenfoot objects cannot leave the world, they cannot step outside of the world, now because it's facing the edge, and I ask, can you move now? It says false. What we have just done here, just with this simple interaction, is we've already seen, just sort of briefly encountered, many of the most fundamental principles of object-oriented programming. We have seen that a project consists of a collection of classes. From a class, you can create objects. In fact, from one class, you can create multiple objects. Uh, you can communicate with objects by invoking methods on the objects. Methods may have parameters, and they may return a value. Those are the basic fundamental principles of object-oriented programming. And the, the, the point here is that you don't have to stand there and just talk about it and explain it. In fact, you have to say very little about it. If you use a standard professional IDE for Java programming, if you use NetBeans or Eclipse or IDEA, where what you see on screen is mostly lines of code, 
Essentially, when you're looking at your IDE, you're staring at lines of code. Explaining the difference between a class and an object is rather difficult. That has been, before environments like this, one of the most difficult concepts to explain. People look at the code and they don't look, they don't understand whether they're looking at a class or an object. And if you were supposed to answer this, you know, is that a class or an object that you're looking at? The actual answer is, well, it depends. It's, it's both, sort of. You know, if you're thinking about static dependencies, you're thinking about classes. If you're thinking about the execution and have the dynamic model in mind, then it's object. But you have to form quite a complex model in your mind um, to actually even visualize this and understand this. And here, the environment is designed to visualize and make experienceable through interaction these concepts without you actually having to say much about it. It becomes entirely clear what the class is and what an object is. The question actually never comes up. Um, so let me just do some more. I can also invoke a method on the world object itself. I can put some leaves in here and if I now put the wombat onto a leaf and I say eat leaf, it can eat the leaf. There's one method that is special. If I, I have one method here that's called act. If I invoke the act method, I'm telling the wombat essentially, well, do whatever you want to do, whatever I have programmed there. The act method is special because it is inherited from the actor class. Um, all the subclasses of actor are the objects that can be in the world. So the actors are the things that can be inside my world. And because the act method is inherited from actor, all specific actor objects always have an act method. And then there is a button down here called act. I don't know whether you can see that very well. It's very low down. But if you can't see, believe me, there's a button there that's called act. If I click the act button, that just invokes the act method on every object in the world. It's just as if I go around and say act to every object that is in here. So. I can say act here. So if I click act, every time I click act, every object in the world acts. The leaves are also object, objects, and their act method happens to be empty. Leaves don't do anything, so you don't see any visual effect. But every object in the world has its act method invoked. And then there's a run button down here. And run, if I click this, is just a loop around act. So if I click run, the act method of all the objects gets invoked over and over again. And that is how we execute programs in Greenfoot. So there is no public static void main. There is no loop you have to write. The code you write is you just specify behavior of objects, and then they just start doing stuff. The model is quite simple. <coughs> and well, what I have programmed here the behavior of the wombat is quite simple. I, I've just written, you know, if, if they happen to sit on a leaf, then they eat the leaf. Otherwise, they move forward. And if they can't move forward, they turn left. And so that's why they all end up running around in circles very quickly, because I was too lazy to write something more interesting. Um, and at the end of this sort of short introduction, you know, you can open up the class and you say, look, here, this is Java code. This specifies what this wombat can do. And now we will spend the next how many months learning how to write this stuff so that we can make it do whatever we want to make it do. And when we start programming, I typically use another example um, I have here. Oops, didn't click properly. I have here a similar example this time. Oh, a bit too high up. This time it's not a wombat, it's a crab, but that difference is fairly minor. I can put my crab into the world, and then I click run, and nothing happens. And then we can open the editor, and we see why nothing happens. Oops, that's also too high up. Here's the editor. And we see, here's the act method. There's no code in here. So when I just click run, that act method was actually executed. It was executed over and over again, and it did over and over again nothing. So now I can start writing some code. So I say write in here move three cells forward. I compile, put my crab in again. If I click act now, it moves a tiny bit because you can actually specify the size of a cell in your world. With a wombat, it was a very big cell. Now I've got a very, in fact, now my cell is just one pixel. So it actually moves only three pixels forward. But if I click Run, it walks across the screen. 
So I have the first animation effect here with just one single line of code. Uh, I can also make that a turn instead of a move. And what will the crab do? Well, it's not hard to guess, it turns. So I've got a rotating grab. At that point, obviously, if I do that with kids, and if I, I, this is the example I most often use in workshops. If I, I often do sort of one day or half day workshops where I have them for three, four hours or so, and I use this example. At that point, when I, I show them, you know, you can, I've, you've seen with right clicking and selecting new crab, you can create one. And I tell them there's a shortcut. If you shift click in the world, that also creates an object. Once you tell them that and you've got the turning, there's always one who will fill the whole world with crabs and puts a few hundred crabs in and they just click, 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 and, and you know, as fast as they can. Um, and then of course they turn. Um, and, but this is already, this is important, right? There, there you already see an important concept that you know, if you program something in your class, you can create as many objects as you like and they will all do it. You know, so by programming your class, you influence the behavior of all instances of that class, and you can have as many instances as you like. That actually is not a trivial concept, but the design of Greenford is such that these important concepts are visualized. And then we can, for example, turn and move. And then I always like to ask the kids, you know, what happens, what's the effect? You can always you know, ask these, you know, what if questions, you know, what, what will it do? Any idea? It walks in a circle, exactly. Someone said that at the back there. And then typically, you know, with kids, I do a few little sort of thinking exercises when, when you say, okay, now the turn three, the three here is actually the, the angle in degrees, how much I turn after every step. So at the moment, I go one step and then I turn a bit, and then I go a step and I turn a bit, and I go, and if you have young kids that have trouble visualizing that, you can actually do that as exercise where you make them walk uh, uh, around the classroom and where you put someone there like the crab and the others tell them what to do and you say, I now move and then, and so the three, that's the angle of turning out of 360 degrees, and I say, well, what if I wanted to run in a larger circle? What would I have to change with the angle? Do I need a smaller or larger angle? And I think about that a bit and half of them get it wrong and half of them get it right. But you can start thinking about these things. And of course, if I put a smaller angle here, I will get a larger circle. If that surprises you, sit back and think about it for a second. It is true. And it runs in a larger circle. And of course, again, you know, it's quite nice. If you want more of them, see what they all do and then you get this sort of synchronized swimming going on here. Um, Oh, one last thing I, I should show you, because I don't want to now program too long, I, I just want to give you an impression, is very quickly, if I now write something like if greenfur dot is, is key down right, um, Greenford has a method to check whether a key on my keyboard is being pressed right now. That is the is key down method. So I can check whether this particular key is currently being pressed. Every key has a name. Right is the name of my right cursor key. And of course, the, the letter keys, the letter is their name. They're, that's fairly straightforward. The A key is called A and so on. But all the function keys have names. So right is my right cursor key. I'm saying, well, I only want to turn when the cursor key is being pressed. And then I can copy and paste this and, and modify it and say, well, if my left cursor key is pressed, then I turn minus two. Um, let's make it a bit quicker turn. Let's make it three. Um, and I move in any case. So if I now put my crab in and I run this, I can now control this crab with my keyboard. And so here, and that is, you know, sort of, when I do this with kids, I don't talk so much about background. I, I first get on with doing things. After 15 or 20 minutes, we have a keyboard controlled moving character on screen. Uh, another in, an important pedagogical thing is, here, um, what we call sort of a spiral introduction of material. We have seen here as concepts method calls with parameters, and in fact with different types of parameters, method calls with string and integer parameters, and an if statement. That's the concepts we have used. Um, that is not trivial for a first, but the point is at first we only introduce it deep enough to just get going, to just do what you need to do. Um, it is a mistake when you introduce a concept to think you have to say everything there is to say about this concept. 
We, say, we explain just enough to solve the task at hand and get on with the job. And the spiral thing comes in later. We come then later, we come back to the concept and we deepen it. We come back, back and we say more and more um, after some time. But at first, the thing is to get going. And so this is the start of our programming. And after a while, you get to, uh, what have I got? This one, for example, to two projects such as this one, um, which is not that fundamentally different. So, so if I run this, I can now control this rocket with my keys here. I can put the sound up and then I can Didn't mean to do that. I wanted to at least get one of the... So, programs like this, video games, you know, simple, simple games, um, is the kind of thing, the kind of program you can very easily write with Greenfoot. So this is a sort of a typical example. After a couple of months or so, we might get to a point where we can write this. Um, anything that has two-dimensional graphical output with moving objects on screen is what Greenfoot is optimized for, so Greenfoot makes it very easy to generate this animation. Um, these programs don't have to be games, just to show you that there are other possibilities, because games are clearly the most popular and the most obvious class of programs, and a lot of the kids will be writing games, but it doesn't have to be. This is an example here, for example, if I run this, where I can just have a piano, and with my keys on my keyboard, I can play it. Um, if we look at this, every one of those keys is an object and they're just objects arranged on the screen and they are programmed here and in fact the implementation of this is quite simple. I have here in my, in my key class five fields. The, each key is remembering whether it's currently being pressed down or not. It has a key on my keyboard, so every, every piano key on, on screen is bound to one of my keyboard keys that it reacts to. It has a sound file that it plays when it gets activated. And then it has two images, one that shows the key in the up state and one that shows it in the press down state. So these are the five fairly simple, straightforward bits of information. The constructor just initializes those five fields and receives those values as parameters and initializes them, very simple. And all the interesting stuff is happening here. This is the whole action code for the key. It just says, well, if we were not down, but now on the keyboard my key is being pressed down, which means it was just pressed right now, then we play our sound, and the play method is implemented here as a one-line method because Greenfoot has a play sound method built in where you just give the name of the sound file and play, plays it. So we play our sound, we show the image that we are pressed down now and we're remembering that we're down. And then if we were down before, but the keyboard key is not being pressed down anymore, so it's just been released, then we change the image again to show it the key up again. And that's it. And then there is a bit more code in the world class to create and arrange the keys. And that's actually quite a nice exercise for loop um, and in fact for arrays as well because I've got an array of keyboard keys and an array of sound files that get then matched against each other. So, oh, one last class of program I should show you is simulations. Simulations are a wonderful class of programs. Mostly they are so good because you actually need a computer to do that. Um, it, when you choose your introductory problems, well, one thing that we certainly don't do is to write Hello World. Um, it's just not interesting. It doesn't illustrate any useful concept. It, um, but also some other classic examples. For example, when I learned programming, we did a lot of mathematically influenced examples. We had things, you know, like print out the prime numbers from 1 to 100. And in fact, you still see that in many textbooks today that they start with examples like this. That is bad for a whole number of reasons. There is well, first of all, it's, it's math, right? Which means three quarters of your class already don't want to know. <laughs> um, but also, it is, it is not something that you would reasonably do. Now, if you actually wanted to know the prime numbers from one to 100, I'm probably quicker with a bit of paper and a calculator than I wouldn't write a Java program. That's not a natural solution to that problem. In fact, if you really wanted to know this, the prime numbers from 1 to 100, what would you do? 
Google, exactly. It takes you five seconds and you have the answer. That's what you really would do. So writing a program to print that out is in some sense nonsensical. It's because you, the program isn't useful. Of course, when you can solve it, once you've write, uh, written it, and it compiles and runs and it produces the correct output, that feels good for a moment because you've shown yourself you can do it. There is a success moment and, and it, it makes you feel good. But that's very brief because once that works, there is no reason on earth why, would you, why you would run it again. You get the same output again. You, know? you, you run it once and then it's immediately useless. You know, and if you have students of different ability in your class, you know, you know, you think that activity that will take them, you know, two days, and one of them is finished after ten minutes. You know, you, you always have that. There's always this wide variety. What you want to do is, you want for the quick and good ones, you want to have something obvious that they can now do in addition. Where you say, oh, you now go and and do this as well, and do this as well. That's why game examples are so good because they always have dozens of ideas in mind. What else they can add on? And the good ones can do a lot more, and they can do interesting things, they can do things that they want to do while they are, you know, while you are sort of trying to help the slower ones along to solve it. You want them, you want the good ones, especially the good ones, you don't want them to get bored and, and then walk away because it's, it's not interesting enough. You want them to do something interesting and useful while you get everyone else over the hurdle. So there is just no visible, you have obvious extension of this example, and you would, yeah, I mean, what do you do then? Print down the number from 1 to 200? Or so, you know, it, so it's, it just doesn't go anywhere. The program isn't useful, and even when you ran it the first time, you learned nothing, because you already knew exactly what it would print out. In fact, you knew that you were done when it printed exactly what you knew all along it should print. Now, so it's, it's, it's a very artificial exercise, and you get only this brief success moment, but simulations are great because that's what computers actually do. All the world's fastest supercomputers, they all run simulations. Weather simulations, nuclear explosion simulations, chemical traffic simulations. Here I've got one which is an ant simulation. So I've got two ant hills here, and I've got ants coming around, and there are food sources, and they're running around. And the behavior of the ants is programmed actually quite simply. So they run around entirely randomly until they happen to run into some food. If they run into some food, they will pick some up and carry it back home to the ant hill. And while they're going home, carrying food, they leave drops of pheromones on the ground. That's this whitish clouds that you see here. When they're running around randomly and they smell a pheromone, they will just turn straight away from the anthill and go that way. Just sort of go with a back to the anthill, assuming the food is somewhere that way. And the effect you get is if you get a single ant, like this one, you know, it found some food, is running home, busily dropping pheromones, it will never find the way back because the pheromones evaporate too quickly. But if you get enough ants together, like these, then you get these stable trails forming. Let me just show that again. I have, I can also actually insert objects into running programs, so I can just create some more objects and drop them in here. So if you get enough of the ants together, like here, then you get these stable trails because they continuously re refresh the pheromones and then the trail remains stable. The fascinating thing about this is that there is nothing in the code anywhere at all about trails forming. No ant individually knows anything about trails. They only know their simple individual behavior. They only know, if I smell pheromone, I go that way. And this trail forming is truly emergent behavior. So you have a fairly simple individual object behavior, but you get interesting system behavior. And the interesting thing is, it's quite hard to predict. You know, when I wrote this, I was sitting there all afternoon fiddling with the behavior of the ants and doing, making them do this and this and so see in which way they can form better trails. Uh, because you actually don't know. It's, and you sit there and you play, and every time you see something new that you didn't know would happen. And now you can ask some interesting question. You can say, well, now what if I introduce pollution here? And the effect of the pollution is that the ants can smell only half as well. So they need to be half the distance to the pheromone before they can smell it. Will they still be able to form paths? It's actually very, very hard to answer in, in an abstract way. But there's one simple solution that is program it. Try it out. And we do. And then there's actually a reason to use a computer because that's what computers are for. And you need a computer to ask it. It's an interesting question. It's fun to play with and you learn something. In fact, you can, in fact, if you design it nicely, you can learn something about biology at the same time. 
So these are the kinds of examples that we use. I, I want to stop very soon because I want to open it to questions. But one last thing. I'll show you one last example because there's another principle here. And that principle is another thing how you can make it interesting is to use real data. Here, for example, I've got an example that is in, in a project that's quite simple. If I click Act, it goes out and gets weather data. And this is actually live, real data. So here in New York, it's now 4 degrees Celsius. You can translate that to Fahrenheit in your head if you want to. Um, because I wrote it Celsius, that's what we do. Um, but this is... You know, this is not fake. You know, this is actually just went out to the internet and grabbed some data. There is a lot of data out there on the internet that you can use. Using some real data is just fascinating, you know, because suddenly your program does something that, that seems much more real. You know? So there are many ways how you can make your examples that you use more interesting and still teach exactly the same concepts. But because they're more interesting, your students will listen better. In fact, because we start with a game-like example, you know, this crab thing that I do. We develop that into a little game where the crabs run around and eat worms and get chased by lobsters and they have to escape. They, very, very quick, they ask me how to do things. They say, you know, how can I do this and how can I do that? And once they come with these questions, then you've won. Then you can, you know, then you can t teach them anything. So Greenfoot, the purpose of Greenfoot is to enable you, there's two things. One is to enable you to teach in a way that is much more interesting, engaging, and with that means for us visual and interactive, um, so that you can use much richer, more interesting examples. And the second thing is it illustrates some of the important concepts for you almost automatically without you even having to do anything. You, know, you can experience some of the, some of the um, really principles of programming. I will, I've talked for longer actually than I intended already. So I will end here and we've got another, I don't know, 45 minutes or so for questions. So I will stop here now and open it up and talk about anything. You have prizes you for question askers. Okay. So. That, that's good. So you, you stand there. You can hand them out to whoever asks a question. Um, and I, let me say, because I've seen that once when someone else did this, can I have a book is not a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the first one was over there. Um, how long is the time between making the crab move and making that ant simulation in terms of um, getting the class Okay, both of these examples are out of the book. For one is in, in the, the crab thing gets developed in the first three chapters. The ants thing is in chapter... Oh no, it's, it's right at the end. You know, so. so it depends on the age of the, of the pupils and how much contact you have. Now, in, in uh, sort of at the level of introductory university, we would cover that material in about three months. Um, at school level, if you've got a you know, 15-year-old, you probably need longer. But it, it, it depends heavily on you know, how much contact time per week you have. Uh, so it would be make much more sense to, to answer the question in number of hours, but I don't really have the answer. This is a, I'm using it for the first time. And I just finished the piano. So this is my semester. This, I, I think it was doing 40 minutes a day. And we are almost through the first quarter, and we are finishing the piano tomorrow. And we'll start Newton on Monday. So I don't know how much further I have to go, though, to get to the ant simulation, yes. because this is the first time I've done it. But it so is fantastic. The ones before, thank you, by the way, for that comment. The ones before the piano introduce many of the basics, object interaction, object calls, and so on. The piano itself introduces loops and arrays. After that comes a chapter, the new chapter, that introduces other collections and object interaction. Um, and then you're pretty much there. And then I'm going to try to let them, as you suggested, much of my second semester quarter is going to be them creating and seeing what they, that's my plan. I don't know what's really going to happen. But that's the, that's the plan at the moment. Okay. I have no idea anymore in what order the hands went up here. So I will randomly. Um, 
go through them. You can do both, and what is better depends a lot on their interest and their age. Um, if they're very young, you know, if you've got ten-year-olds, you're better off doing a while of scratch first. You know, if they are older, if they're 15, 16, you can either start straight with Greenfoot or you can still do a bit of scratch first. Scratch covers some concepts in a in in an easier interaction. You know, because you can essentially not make any syntax errors. You have, you know, the representation of loops with these blocks is is clearer. Um, and but mainly the syntax issue is, is, is goes completely away. That's a big one. Even if you have older students, you know, of, of 16, 17 year old, then you might not want to do Scratch for a whole semester. Then you might want to do Scratch only for two weeks. But doing that before can ease the transition. But if they're keen and 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 interested and bright enough, you can also start straight with Greenfoot. There are some students who react better to this, who think Scratch is too much of a toy and they, they don't take it seriously. Um, different pupils react differently to this. But I think actually doing a bit of Scratch before is a good thing. Scratch and Greenfoot form a really nice sequence because they have very similar views of, of the programming world. Um, Scratch is a bit simpler because it's object-based, so you don't have classes. You you, you program instances directly, um, which is easier initially, but then you run into s some limitations where certain things you can't do so easily. Um, Greenfield is class-based, it's more general. You can do more things, it performs much better, you can have larger examples. Um, so it's a, it's a nice sequence, um, uh, but either one can work. I've seen both cases, people going through Scratch or something similar before, or people going straight into Greenfield, they both can work. Yes. Uh, I've got a very recent success story that demonstrates the two points you just made. So I started a new job this past Monday in high school. So I assumed the Java class and the advanced Java class. And after one day, I realized they were not getting it because they did not have enough perspective. They had their noses buried in Java code. So for advanced Java, I went to right to Greenfoot. And for basic Java, I'm having them do scratch. And then I'm going to move them on to Greenfoot and then onto a real job. I'm going to wean them from, from Greenfoot eventually. Yeah. For, for, for many beginners, especially younger, um, the syntax is a hurdle. And it's a hurdle that distracts from the actual concepts. And so that's why Scratch, which removes the syntax and lets you focus more on the concepts, is useful. And then in Greenfoot you get, certainly in the current Greenfoot version, you get the syntax problems then in addition to this. and Separating it out, taking it one at a time, makes it a little easier. Yes? <coughs> Maybe misremembering this, but I believe we showed at a CSDA conference a while ago an interface that was Java. But avoided yes. Um, okay, maybe this is the time to show this. I mentioned um, at the beginning that we are working on a new version of Greenfoot that has the, the it's Greenfoot 3, we call that, because this one was 2. So, uh, very original naming. Greenfoot 3 differs mostly in that it has a different editing interface. Here's Greenfoot 3, and I can show you what that is. So, what when we designed this, um, you see this so far looks pretty much the same. There's my crabs example again. This is a bit further on where I've my, got my worms and my lobsters already in it. And when I run it, I run around, I can eat my worms. The, so far it looks very similar. When we designed this, our goal was to have an interaction for the actual program manipulation that removes many of the problems that we have with Java, of the syntax problems. In fact, what we wanted to is to create something that's somewhere in the middle between block-based programming like Scratch or Alice and full textual programming like Java or Python, some, something that gets sort of the benefits of both. And the benefits of the block-based system is that it avoids many of the syntax errors. In fact, if you do it well, like Scratch does, for example, you avoid just about all syntax errors. Um, the representation of some constructs is much clearer, for example, a loop. Um, and also, of course, the, 
the manipulation is initially easier for beginners. But text-based systems also have a justification. They, they have real advantages. Now, no professional practice programmer uses a block-based language, and for a good reason. Because when you have larger programs, they're just not readable. It, it's a mess. You know, you can't, if you have a really long program, if you have, think, thousands of lines, you cannot read it in a block-based language. They are just too messy. Navigation doesn't work very well. The representation is also, it's, you know, it's too, just too much color, too much visual noise. Um, the interaction is tedious for professionals because this dragging the blocks, which is really a help for beginners, is a hindrance for professionals because once you know what you're doing, it is much slower. You have to sort of drag this out and then separate these out and put these back if you don't. Um, so manipulation in text-based systems is actually much quicker for professionals and also the re representation. You know, if you're a professional who looks at code every day, all day, and is trained in reading it, you can read a Java program much more quickly than a Scratch program. So for professionals, the criteria are different. And we wanted to sort of get the best of everything. And so we have an editor and what we call frame-based programming. And this is a version that we have just released in a preview version. So you can download it now, but it's not a finished release yet. This is sort of an alpha or beta, well, preview is what we call it, uh, for the purpose of you know, enabling people to try it out and give us feedback, but it's not ready for cl classroom use yet. Um, and this is what it looks like. So this is a CRAB program in a language called Stride. That's the language that we have in here now. And one, the first thing you see is the representation. If you have an if statement here, the scope of the statement is not shown by a pair of curly brackets anymore. It's, it's shown graphically with a box. Because some things, the, well, the main difference in Stride is not the language itself. The language is very, very Java-like. It is, it is almost Java, almost like Java, minor differences. The main differences are in the interactions of how you edit it. Because here, um, if I now, want to move a statement around, I can take it and drag it somewhere else. If I want to insert a statement, um, if I'm here, I want an if statement, I hit a single key and I get an if statement. And I can fill in the condition and I can go into the body and I can fill in some code here, I can put in an assignment. If I put hit a single key, I get an assignment. In the assignment, I can fill in the details, but I either have a statement or I don't have it. So just like in the block-based languages, you never have half an if statement. In fact, if you think about it, there is no reason on earth why you should be able to ever have half a statement. The reason that we do that in text-based languages is purely historical because 60 years ago, whenever text editing started or we went from line editors to screen editors, text is all we had. There were only text terminals. That's why everything is represented by text. But some concepts, such as scope, for example, is not best represented by a pair of characters that can then be separated and go all over the place or where you can delete one without deleting the other. Drawing a box around it is actually visually much clearer and the semantics is much clearer. And so here, I can, if I delete this statement, of course, if I delete this if statement, I delete the whole statement. I cannot delete part of a statement. I just deleted it while also deleting the body of the statement. If I have something in here and I put something in or put an assignment in, um, I can also delete it without deleting the body and leave the body there. Or I can do that the other way around. I can have some statements and hit a key and surround them with an if statement. Now I can put it in the statement. And if I drag this, I'm dragging the whole if statement. And I can drop it somewhere else. I can take um, any frame that is technically what we, we call frames are the interface element. Every statement in the language is represented by a frame, and I can drag them around. In a traditional text-based editor, if you work in Eclipse or so, you can also select text and you can drag it. But you have to be very, very careful. First of all, when you select it, if you select an if statement, you have to make sure that you don't forget the closing bracket. You know, and even, uh, that's not all. You actually, it also is relevant whether you include the trailing carriage return or not, because that will affect your formatting. No, and when you then drop it, you can drop that selected text in the middle of a keyword. No, it makes no sense why you can drop code into the middle of a keyword. So here, when I drag and drop a statement, I can actually drop it only where it is syntactically valid. So first of all, here, I can't even put it in the comment or somewhere in the middle of another statement. Between methods here also, it tells me it can't go there. 
So it will only let me drop it in a way that it maintains correct structure of my program. And because here I'm not actually editing text, I'm actually editing the structure of the program. And then when you do this, you can do many interesting things. Um, once you get to the idea that what you're editing, the representation of the program isn't text, but it's richer interface elements, you can do much more interesting things. For example, if I have a method call, I insert a call and I, actually let me do that in a different class because that crab class actually was meaningful code and I don't want to mess it up too much. But I have here another one which is just essentially a scrap. So if I have here, if I insert a method call and I put my turn method in, then it tells me automatically here how many parameters are expected and what they are. It just writes here, I have to fill in the amount. If you have other professional ideas, some of them in some situations do something similar. For example, if in, in IntelliJ IDEA or NetBeans or in Eclipse or, so, or Visual Studio, if you use code completion, it completes this for you and it will also put something in the parameter. What it puts there varies, but the important thing is what it puts there will become part of your program because it's text. Some environments put there the name of the formal parameter, which is, as far as your code is concerned, almost certainly wrong and will not compile. And then you have to, you get the hint, but you have to remove it. Some uh, um, Eclipse, for example, puts there the name of any variable sort of in the vicinity that has the correct type. So it will just guess and take a variable and put the name there, which is also potentially wrong and actually even more dangerous because it compiles and then just does nonsense. No, uh, and the, but the point is you cannot give a hint and not have text in your code. And he, here, because we, had, we don't have text, we have richer interface and we can actually write something there and still know that it's empty. So we know that you haven't written anything there because that word amount is not part of your program text. And so once you get away from using text as a representation, you can do much more intelligent things. So here it tells me what I need to do um, and I can then fill something in. Um, Navigation is also richer because if I just use my up and down keys, I go line by line. We've done that because that's what people are used to. But if I, if I use that with a modifier key, oops, um, then I move at that level of, of scope. So here, then I go over these statements. And if I do that, for example, at the method level, then I go up and down by method and I can fairly quickly scan through my program. So you get much more intelligent navigation as well because we, we know about the structure of the program. Um, and then we have here a sidebar where we show all the keyboard shortcuts and what you can do. So if you go into a method, this is context sensitive. So if I'm in a method, it shows what I can do here. If I'm between method, it shows what I can do here. So here I can only insert methods or comments. If I go here, I can insert all the things. This is like having the blocks lying there in scratch. You know, this is the recognition of a recall. You don't have to memorize everything up front. You can actually look and see what are my options now. And in Java, there aren't actually that many. This is literally everything you can do. In Java, this is all the statements you've got. And that's much fewer than in Scratch, because in Scratch, um, all the blocks, every different action is a separate block. And of course, in Java, that is all just a method call. So the method call here incorporates most of the blocks in Scratch. And so in, because we are only showing different, con different constructs, this is really all there is. And it's quite you know, easy to see. I can here, if I want an if statement, I can either just click on this and I get the if statement, or I can just look at it and see the keyboard shortcut. So this, this, this show me, shows me the keyboard command to insert this into my text. And you can edit this completely keyboard driven. You never have to touch the mouse if you don't want to. As I've shown you with the dragging and the clicking, you can if you want to, but you can work entirely keyboard based. So professionals can actually become very, very quick with this. Um, and then also doing this um, you, once you get away from text, there's some sort of nice things you can do. For example, when you have long methods, um, often, you know, when you scroll, the method signature scrolls out of view and you don't know where you are anymore. When we scroll up, we pin the method header here to the top of the screen and then you, you know where you are. And especially when you scroll backwards, you see what method you're in. You know, you always see this. Um, and when you scroll out, 
then you, so the relevant contextual information, we just keep it on screen because it's much more interesting to see which method you're in than just seeing one more random line of code. Um, we do that also with other scopes. So if you have a long if statement, like here for example, when you scroll that out, we write into the side here the condition of the statement you're looking at. So once you get used to that you're not editing text, you have a much richer representation and we can do a lot more. So what we achieve here is, like the block-based languages, we avoid many syntax errors. We don't avoid all syntax errors. You can still make a good number of syntax errors. It's not like in Scratch where you avoid almost all of them, but you avoid many of them. You, know, so you, you avoid half of them maybe. We haven't done a study to have exact numbers, but many syntax errors you just can't do anymore. We also get you know, the recognition, we have the, the help in seeing what statements you can do in. But for professionals, this is actually more readable than standard text or Java code because you can't mess up your indentation. You know, you can't, you can't sort of um, you know, have your bracket on the wrong line and then it all looks funny. Um, the layout is always consistent, it's always the same, and it will always show you exactly what your program does. And the entering, the editing and entering of the program is actually quicker than in professional environments. We can enter the same program, we've done some studies with it, we can enter the same program with fewer keystrokes, significantly fewer keystrokes than standard text editors. Um, so we hope that both students and professional programmers should benefit from this, and that will be the next version of Greenfoot. Does this translate to Java? Yes, so what it will do is the next version, Greenfoot 3, will have this editor in it, Stride with this editor, but also the old editor with standard Java. You can use either one. So if you want to, you can just ignore all this and do exactly what you did before. The Java editor will still be there. You can, even in a single scenario, mix it and have some classes in Stride and some in Java. And you can translate. So you can either, there's a quick preview where you can see this as standard Java code and you can toggle back and forth or you can translate this um, to Java code where you then cannot go back but then you can edit. You can then continue editing it as Java code. Um, but you can't go back at the moment from Java code to Stride because Stride is a subset of Java. So there's some Java programs that we can't translate. So if you just use the preview, you can flip back and forth but not edit, or you can transform it and then edit and not go back. But our goal, we, we really, I, I, I think this way of editing will eventually replace text editing. So I think, you know, if we look at 15 years from now, I think most editors will look like this. But I realize also that, you know, for the near future, we still want to get people into Java and train them in standard Java text or programming. So at the moment, this is designed as a stepping stone into textual standard Java programming. So we will, we do support starting like this and then switching to Java. Yes, there's the next question. Do you, do you have any like, ways of running Greenfoot without people actually installing Greenfoot, either let's say in Blue Day or online? Is there a way to do it to get all this within Yes, we have no online version and no sort of no install version. Greenfoot still is a standalone application that has to be installed. We have one way, we can run it from a USB memory stick. We have one version that you can put on a memory stick and plug in and you can run it straight from there without any further installation. It is essentially installed on that memory stick. That does work, but we have no online version that runs in a browser or or something like this. So it still is a separate application. And even though it would be nice to have a sort of no install, you know, web-based version, at the moment we don't have the manpower to, to do that. It would be very nice, too much work for us at the moment. Yes? I don't know, but a lot less than you have. Um, it's, it's of a size that, that has never been an issue. I don't know the number, but you don't run into a limit anymore. Yes. Um, can you tell us how to share or how projects are shared? And also, have you, um, how do you know what, what kids are learning? Or have you done any sort of assessment? Um, Okay, the last question. First, the uh, assessment. Um, we have done a little bit, but other groups have done um, studies about the effect of both Blue Jay and Greenfoot um, and about what they're learning. And there, there's sort of a, a number of papers out there. And um, typically, um, what they 
come out with is that they um, learn the imperative constructs, you know, sequence, um, iteration, selection, and so just as well as, as others, but get a much stronger foundation in the object-oriented constructs. Um, so that the, the actual you know, object concepts that was compared to a what they called objects late approach, where they were teaching with a, with a standard IDE and were teaching essentially the procedural constructs first, you know, to teach um, sequence and loops and, and method calls, and then introduced objects towards the end of the course. And that was compared with teaching with Greenfoot in an objects early teaching style. Um, so there was a difference in teaching sequence and an environment, and then you have to it's hard to pick out where which effect comes from, but that is, and that is essentially the effect that they have seen. And the other question was about sharing. Um, there is, in Greenfoot, um, let me go back to this Greenfoot version. There is a share button here. Oh, there's a share button here. If I click share, I get to this dialog where I can choose an icon and that I can, for that icon I can zoom and pan here so that is essentially just taking the image of my screen here. Um, I can write a description and, and a title and then I hit the share button and it goes to a website, to the Greenfoot website here and there are, this, this is sort of the Greenfoot community website um, where there are discussion section and scenarios uploaded. And so if you go there, um, this is getting increasingly problematic. Oh, and you can see exactly why. Um, what this does is it creates your scenario as an applet and uploads it to a server and then gets you to a, a web page uh, with this applet on it. Unfortunately, this is becoming increasingly problematic because applets are very quickly dying. It's a dying technology. It is getting increasingly hard to convince your browser to display applets, unfortunately. So if you have a class and you want your class to use it, you want to talk them through um, how to configure your browser to still allow applets to be shown. In most browsers now, applets are by default blocked and you have to go through some preference settings and security settings to allow applets still to be shown. Um, we have not done the work yet to replace this, even though we know in the next few years we, this will go out of, this will essentially not function anymore because the browsers are all pushing applets out now. Um, so in my browser, because I did an upgrade recently also, I haven't got applets enabled. Um, but if you have, then um, this will run right in the browser. If you don't, if it doesn't, then there is also um, a download. You can then download this um, if, if the source code was uploaded and um, run it locally. Um, attached to these scenarios that are uploaded is then, other, is then a discussion stream. So other, other people can then comment on it um, and leave suggestions or ask questions or they can download the code and see um, how that was implemented if it was uploaded. So if you upload a scenario, it's your choice whether you include the source code as well or not. You can also upload without source code. Um, and then there's a general discussion section on the side where there's a lot of kids there and they are just asking general questions. They say, how do I do this and how do I do this? And there's very active discussion and sharing of these scenarios. So there is a website for that. Um, yes? Um, I had been passing on the rumor myself that Python was about to replace Java on AP exam in the States. Until the other day, I was stopped by tracks by a woman who works with the college board. And she pointed out how difficult that would be. I mean, what do you see as the future of Java versus Python as an educational programming model? I think from there's, there's a pedagogical view and there's a practical view. From a pedagogical point of view, there isn't a great deal of difference. I think they're both very robust, quite nice object oriented languages um, that are serve equally well to illustrate general object oriented programming concepts. There are some minor differences. Um, Python is not statically typed. I personally, and, and so people are divided, but I prefer, I personally like statically typed languages. And I prefer Java because of this, because I don't think that dynamic typing helps you particularly in explaining programming. Because to write a correct program, it is absolutely necessary to have the type of your object in mind anyway while you write your code. 
Otherwise, you cannot write correct code. And if you know the type, you may as well write it down. In fact, for a learner, it's good discipline to write it down. Not only you know, demonstrates it you know, more clearly or forces you to think about it and make a decision, it demonstrates to your instructor what you think it is. Also, if you get it wrong, your error message is much better. You get it much closer to the source of the error, both in time and in location. So static typing is, I also think that um, there are more interesting and better developed, more mature environments around for Java. That is not a characteristic of the language itself. Um, and there's no um, hurdle in principle why there shouldn't be better um, environments for Python and a whole number of groups are working on some. But I think the material at this stage is still better for Java. But that may change sometime soon. That is not a, 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 a criticism in principle just at the moment, I think. Um, Python has slightly simpler syntax. That's always um, the main reason mentioned in favor of Python is that it has less boilerplate, you know, let, uh, the, the curly brackets uh, thing. And I, th that is, I think that difference is actually relatively minor. Often be for beginners that makes a difference and also teachers who are beginning often say, well, it looks simpler, you know, I like that better. But in, if you have the right environment, something like Greenfoot, for example, that boilerplate essentially gets generated for you anyway, and you still really type only a single line of code to make something happen. So with a good environment, you can mitigate that problem to a very large degree, so that it, in my view, actually isn't a problem anymore. So I don't, that's the argument I hear most in favor of Python, and I don't actually believe that it's a very strong argument. So in principle, between those two languages, I have a mild preference for Java because of the typing. But Python is a perfectly good language and can certainly work as well. Um, the difference really pedagogically isn't very strong. So that for the AP course, for example, I think it's not worth the trouble. I think the gain, if you get any at all, is not big enough to be worth the trouble of actually changing that whole thing. We have time for one more. Yes, it's localizable quite easily. At the moment, we have the interface in, I don't know exactly, about 12 different languages or so. Um, that is all contributed by volunteers. So all the common languages are there. You know, that it is there in, in, in Spanish and French and German and Chinese and, and some slightly smaller languages. Um, and it is very easy to do. That's why, that's why there are so many translations. They are just a couple of text files, plain text files, with all the labels in it, and there's, you just have to take the English one and copy it and replace, you know, about 200 words or so, or strings, short strings, um, can be done in a few hours. Um, and so we have translations for, for quite a few languages. Well, thank you for coming out and spending time with us.